Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 13 of the Suck Hunt series of Z80 programming tutorials in which we look at the Suck Hunt game you can see it above and today we're on the Spectrum Next. The Spectrum Next was actually the second version of the game that I ported. Now, I'm not personally a massive fan of the Spectrum Next, there's nothing particularly wrong with it, it's just it's a modern system, it's not a true retro system but it did have an advantage that it had a very easy to use memory layout and it supported 16 colours at 256 by 192 although we're actually we're running in the 256 colour mode, we're only using 16 of the colours though so it's using layer 2 but as I say it was easier to port than the Sam Coupe version which was the one I did afterwards because the Sam Coupe screen memory is a little bit of a pain to work with whereas the Spectrum Next is a lot more flexible. So Spectrum Next was the thing here and so this was the next version of the game that I ported and we're going to be going over the port today and looking at the source and learning about the start of how I went about porting it and um, how it works on this system. So let's go over to the source code, let's take a look. Okay, so here is the source code. Now the first thing I thought it might be interesting to just quickly mention is the way I actually went about porting this. Now unfortunately this doesn't run anymore, but I, what I did is I created a little test program called ZX Next Suck Hunt Test. And what I did is, um, this is basically a minimal kind of test of the engine in the sense of it tries to print a character to the screen, it tries to show the cursor, it shows a single sprite, and so it, it's a very simple testing ground to get a single sprite onto the screen and test the 3D depth, get a character onto the screen, test the font routine, and check that the cursor is moving around. Now it doesn't work anymore because parts of the um, code that this hooks into have been long since modified beyond the functionality that this test bed provides, but this is what I did was created a very stripped down ultra simplistic version of the game en engine to test the sprite routines and then once those worked started adding functionality to it until I ended up with basically the entire CPC version because the CPC was the original version. So that's how I got it working. Now another problem with the um, Spectrum Next version is unfortunately the size of the game engine. Now the game on the Amstrad CPC was 42K, so that was able to load in a single load, but because of the Spectrum having a bank of ROM in memory, um, that ate away a little bit of memory, and the graphics are 16 color on the Spectrum Next, some of them are the, the, the title screen and the um, tile maps are 16 color, although the in-game graphics are four color and the 3D effect uses the other 12. So basically the game was too big to load in a single load and I didn't really want to be writing a take load in assembly so I've cheated. What I've done is I've created two separate programs. The first one loads into memory and then it copies all of its data into one of the other Spectrum Next banks and it simply quits and returns back to basic. And then what I've done is I've created this basic loader which loads in time after time programs from the tape because I'm running this from a tape emulation into memory and then running them and it, it'll do this up to four times although the um, suck hunt game only needs two banks so the first one is very small all it has in it is the um, title graphics i believe where is it here it is here's the bank one program so this is going to be executed from the c triple zero range um, when it's been loaded into its correct bank the first time it will actually load in at the 6000 address but there's no um there's no code that will mind being relocated here all it's doing is it's paging in so two spectrum next banks into that quadruple zero range and it's copying the six triple zero range to the quadruple zero range and it's copying 16 kilobytes and that's the size of this program and really all that is in there after this header is the tiles for the title map so we just page those into the C000 range when we're showing that thing that you can see up there, the title screen. So that's how we're doing that. Now, the next thing we're going to be discussing is the sprites. Now, the sprites in this game, like all of my games, where is it? The sprites were created with my AcroSprite editor as always. Now, if my memory serves me correct, it was a while ago I ported this game, um, we were using the spec next option here and this save raw 2-bit per pixel bitmaps option here which is for four color sprites because the graphics as I say are basically four colors they're the same um, colors as the CPC version just the um, layout of the pixels pixel data is different so that's how we exported the bitmap data but we also exported a sprite list you can see all of these settings of these sprites here 
we've got this new export info option here and I use that and that exports the data for the game to actually know about the sprites. So first we exported the sprite data and we import that here and then we've got this sprite info and this has the data which can be used to calculate the offset within that sprite data of any sprite. We've got the basic size of the sprite width times height divided by pixels per byte plus the base which will be sprite data in this case it's just the, just there and then we've got the width and the height in pixels and we can use these to convert them for calculating the logical screen units and also for calculating things like the centering of the sprites and the collision detection of the sprites so that's what we use that for now as i say the spectrum next version of the game is using the 256 color mode and if we find the correct thing here basically um, I say I only use 16 colors but the 256 color mode is very nice to work with the game does have sound I've got it switched off just because uh, it's annoying for the videos and it makes clicks in the background sometimes so I've got it turned off but it does use Arcos tracker for the music so um, we did need to actually um, use I'm using into mode one I, I don't like using into mode two it's a pain so what I'm doing is um, I'm basically remapping using the spectrum next registers the first eight kilobytes from zero to one triple F as RAM and then the next bank which of course would usually be ROM on a real spectrum. Um, I'm mapping in screen memory into that area. So I've got my low area, which is available for the interrupt handler, my mid area, which is available for the, um, the screen data and then the rest of the memory, which is the game data. So what I'm basically doing is I'm splitting the screen up into six blocks and I'm paging one of them in. And if I can find it, we've got a function to handle all of that kind of thing for us. Where is it? Here it is. So here's this get screen pause function. And this will actually calculate one sixth of the screen and it will page in that bank and it will page it in in the two triple zero to three FFF range. And so that will page it in and then we can just write to that. And it's just converting the bank number from the top three bits of the screen line here and it's converting that into a bank and then it's paging it in using the next registers. So that is selecting the correct bank based on an X and Y coordinate. Now that's fine for the start of the sprite, but what if the sprite goes over a bank boundary? Well, we've got a get next line function, which will increase the screen memory destination, but it will then check and see if we've gone basically over for triple zero, in which case we've actually gone over the boundary. And what we're doing is we're basically resetting the memory address so that it wraps back to the start of that two triple zero range and we're then incrementing the memory bank register which will effectively move us to the next block of the screen memory and that's how we are actually selecting the screen memory. So how do we draw those sprites? Well the sprite drawing routines all end up running show sprite L for the left eye and show sprite R for the right eye. We draw two sprites together and that will allow us to draw the 3D graphics. So basically what we're doing here is we are drawing a left eye image, basically that's our left eye image, and then we're drawing a right eye image and the two together will create the 3D effect. Now, if we're in 2D mode, we only draw the left eye image. So we need to reconfigure things just depending on our 3D mode there. Now we do that via self-modifying code. So. Here's our left eye sprite routine here. And this will work in the same way in all cases. So what we're doing here is we're, we've got our source sprite in DE. We've got our screen destination in HL and we're XORing the sprite to the screen. The game uses XOR sprites and this is convenient because it means we don't have to deal with double buffering. It also means that we can apply the two layers in two separate functions to create a 3D effect. So that's what we're doing. Now, our source data is two bits per pixel, but our screen is 256 color, so eight bits per pixel. So what we're doing is we're taking two bits from the source data and we're shifting them into the correct position for this color. And so that we're rotating those left, basically moving them to this position here. And then we're shifting all the other bits for a byte of the source data here, as you can see. So each one is different. So there's the first one. There's the second, there's the third, and there's the fourth. And each time we're getting them into the correct position, XORing with them, them with the screen RAM and writing back to the screen RAM and then moving across the screen one byte, one pixel. 
So that's what we're doing. We're then repeating until we've done the end of the line and we're using get next line to move down a line. Now the game does support sprite cropping, sprite clipping, which is where at the end of the screen we might need to actually crop our sprites. So if we've got our screen here, for example, if that's a screen, if that was actually square, which quite clearly isn't, well, maybe we're drawing our moon here. Well, we don't want to see all of that moon because part of it's off the screen, so we would just draw that bit there. That's what our sprite clipping is. And the way we do this is um, we've actually got a function to skip the bytes that we don't want to show because our source data, some of the bytes will be unneeded. And so we use self-modifying code to replace this get next line function here with this one down here. So this one, get next line with clip, will actually remove a number of bytes here. Now this is set to one, but that is also altered via self-modifying code. Now using self-modifying code makes things as fast as we can. So the get next line function and that the number of bytes to skip will be self-modified in. Another thing that will be self-modified is the disabling of show sprite R. We will patch in a return command at the start of that if we don't want to show the right eye, if 3D mode is disabled, that's how we do it. So that's our sprite routines. Now the crosshair routine, that's the um, cursor that also uses show sprite L and show sprite R. So that's, that, that actually works at the pixel level. So the normal routines work in logical units, but show crosshair actually works in pixels. So we've got a, higher resolution routine to calculate our pixel position there. The other thing that uses those routines is the print char routine. This also uses the 3D routines. Basically what we're doing is we've got a cursor X, a cursor Y and a cursor Z, a 3D coordinate, and we are modifying a sprite called SPR char. Now the sprite definitions in my game use 16 bytes with um, coordinates and 3D depths and memory sources, and we're basically patching in all of the data required in the same format and then we can use our draw sprite from my y function to do the job and by trying to funnel as much of the data through a common drawing routine as possible it reduces the amount of code that needs porting to new systems didn't reduce it very much though because this game took two weeks to port to a new system which is why it's not out on very many systems which is a shame but i really couldn't couldn't manage anymore i couldn't take it anymore the game had become quite boring unfortunately we also have a print tile routine. Now this is designed to show eight by eight pixel blocks. Um, the suck hunt title screen there is actually a tile map. So here is the title screen that, as it appears in the game, as you can see, you can see it above me there, but this is actually converted into a tile map. And so the unique tiles are stored as bitmap data. Uh, basically there's a lot of uh, blank tiles in, this, in the actual graphic you can see here. And so all of those can be removed to save some memory. And that is what we do. Basically about half the memory is required compared to being saved as a raw bitmap. So we use that print tile routine to do that. Now the tile map format itself is using up to 512 tiles. I tend to use that format because the um, Sega Master System can only do 512 tiles. So if I'm using more than that, I'm probably gonna have a bad day. Now, basically the format I use is nearly one byte per tile. So you can see here, these zeros are tile zero. That 186 is tile 186. But sometimes I need more than 255 tiles. So where there's a byte 255, then following byte is added to 255 to make the tile number. So basically I'm using sort of 1.5 bytes per tile, if you will. And that is reflected in the code that draws the sprites to the screen when we're doing tiles. So here's the show tile map routine here. So basically this is setting up the tile engine, again using self-modifying code here. I'll explain why in a moment. And basically what we're doing here is we are loading in a tile number here. We're checking if it's 255, if it's lower, we are using a first tile bank. If it's higher, we're using the second tile bank. We load in a second tile number. We add basically um, 255 tiles worth of memory to the source address, and then we run our print tile routine to show the second tile. Otherwise, we just show the first tile. So this routine here is quite long, but this will show a tile map to the screen. Now there is unfortunately one exception to this. The title screen um, on the on the next spectrum next it wasn't so much of a problem but the cpc i was trying to keep the memory quite small to load in a single load so the title screen is actually lower resolution than the regular graphics and so there is an alternate routine 
to show a half height tile. So these are eight by four pixels and each line is drawn twice, doubling the height, making it a bit more vertically chunky, so to speak, but it's not noticeable and the title screen is very quick. So that's what this does. Basically, um, it, it works the same. We're just basically using this draw tile half routine here. And what this does is it will calculate the source location and it will then use this um, do tile line. It does that twice and each one of these will do a pair of lines. And you can see here, we're basically doing the same kind of thing here. So this will show a single line and we run that twice. The regular one actually goes through the character drawing routines and uses the regular sprite routine. So it was unfortunately quite a pain that I had to do that, but it, it was um, needed to get the game running on the CPC, unfortunately. So that's the majority of the sprite drawing routines. That's all we're going to cover today on those, but we are going to go into a little bit more today. The last thing we're going to be discussing is the sound routines. We're going to have a look at how the sound works. Now, the sound uses Arcos Tracker 1. I know there's an Arcos Tracker 2, but I've done a lot of work porting Arcos Tracker 1 to systems that don't use AY and um, it's got all the functionality I need and I know how to use it. So that's what I'm using for now until my um, Chibi Tracker is finished. So how do we use Arcos Tracker? Well, the version I've got has been modified and stripped down. It can only load from a fixed memory address, um, which I specify using Accio Music Pause. Uh, this is the same one as was used in Chibi Akamas, so that's what we've got. So there's multiple songs that the game uses, and the way we handle this is we basically copy the song that we want to play to the destination address that the game is hard-coded to use. So we, we support up to hex 4 double zero bytes. We use an LDIR to copy them, we just start the music up. So that's not really the hard thing about getting the music working. The tricky thing is always the interrupt handler. Um, we're paging in some RAM into the area 0 to 2000. This is so that we can use interrupt mode 1, which is the best interrupt mode. I'm sorry, interrupt mode 2 fans, it's not the best. So we're using interrupt mode 1 here. So we're patching in the to the destination address 0038, which is interrupt mode 1's jump block address. And we're then putting a jump command here, and then we're putting the address of our interrupt handler in. So this is our interrupt handler. And the good thing is, it's very, very simple. So here's our interrupt handler, and all it's doing is it is backing up all of the registers, because Arcos Tracker changes absolutely everything, including shadow registers, and we're just calling the music player there, and that will play the music. And this is um, allows us to play the music. And because uh, the video RAM is paged into a different address, we actually never need to disable interrupts really on this system. So that is how I am handling the music, and it works very well, which is good. So there we go. So that's a brief introduction to Suck Hunt on the Spectrum Next. The game's available now on the website. Go to my website, you can download the source code, and you can download the game, and you can do whatever you want with the source code. As I always say, please go ahead and strip any bits out of it that you find useful, because that's what it's there for. Make, make any use of it you can, and if you manage to make a commercial game, you're welcome to do so, as I always say. Anyway, if you've liked what you've seen today, please consider buying my book. It's called Learn Multi-Platform Assembly with Chibi Alchemist. It covers Z86502, 68,000, 8866 in ARM, and I'm sure you're sick of hearing about it now, and you can get it from Amazon if you want to. You can also buy a Suck Hunt t-shirt from my Teespring store, because believe it or not, it takes a long time to make these games, and I don't often want to do it. it I don't actually really like porting the same game over and over again to lots of different systems. So if you want to see that happen, please support the content. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.